And now it's Deborah Cobalt Co- And now it's Deborah Cobalt Live and Little Italy Podcast. Hi everybody and thank you for joining us for Deborah Cobalt Live and our Little Italy Podcast. Uh, and joining me today is Andrea Lito, who wrote, directed and produced a phenomenal documentary, My Father Moves Mountains about her dad, George Leto, who represented many blacklisted writers back in the uh, McCarthy era. It's quite an incredible story um, that Andrea knows about firsthand. You're also a singer, a performer, and an entrepreneur. And I'm just thrilled to have you join us today, Andrea. Welcome. Thank you, Deborah. It's a pleasure. Um, you've got quite a history yourself, right? Because you grew up in the Hollywood industry. Um, your family was very close to uh, Italian royalty. In fact, that painting behind you, who is that behind you there? That is my father's father, who was a King's Honor Guard. It's an elite soldier of Italy, and it's from the late 1800s. So he guarded King Vittorio Emanuele di Savoia, who was the last king of Italy. Um, And then on my mother's side, my mother is the daughter of the Marquis, which is between a duke and a count. Uh, right. The Marquis of uh, Naples and Sicily. So uh, I'm the great, great grandniece of the last king of Sicily, like the, the famous leopard, the Burt Lancaster movie. So that is wow. my history on both sides. Wow. So we've got real royalty uh, joining us today. Thank you for being here, Miss Andrea. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, but on both sides of your family, there's so much talent. And we're here today to start to talk about Dad George who really was an incredible man and saw a need to represent people at a time that he thought that they were incredibly, um, you know, it it was very unfair what was being done to them in the Hollywood community. Can you talk to us about George and his career representing writers during that time? Sure. He started at William Morris in the mailroom, like just about every other agent. And he quickly got out because um, he, he already knew how to book uh, bands right. because he had a jazz band. He was a jazz saxophone player and he even wrote a song before he started working at William Morris that Louis Armstrong recorded called <clears throat> which is on the DECA collection um, and so he went on he decided <laughs> he didn't want to become a musician because uh, jazz was sort of falling all out of favor and rock and roll was becoming the thing. Right. So he moved on and became an agent hoping to become a music agent. Well as fate would have it he ended up representing writers and directors. And in the early 60s, he moved to Los Angeles and he decided to open his own agency around 1966 because he he wanted to represent these blacklisted writers that had no longer been able to work or had been working under assumed names or working with fronts because the studios were hiring them. But they were paying them a pittance and they weren't allowing them to work under their own names. The only one so far who had cracked through was Dalton Trumbo with Spartacus. And even Talton mm. came to become my father's client because he couldn't get another job after Spartacus under his wow. own name. So my father wow. represented several of the Hollywood 10, many of what they call the unfriendly 19, and many blacklisted writers and directors and put together the famous films Midnight Cowboy, MASH, Planet of the Apes, Happy On. Helen Willie Boy is here. Um, Arnold Pearl, he represented, who worked with Aussie Davis and Alex Haley. My father represented the script Malcolm X in the late wow. 60s, the same movie that Spike Lee made in the 1990s. My father then went on because, frankly, he hadn't been controversial enough, I guess, to <laughs> sell the first all black film by Melvin Van Peoples called Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. Wow. So my you know, father you're... didn't have any idea about convention. He just did what he thought was good, and he represented talent. And he figured that the marketplace would dictate whether or not it would be something people would pay attention to. He didn't care about anything else. Your dad passed away, I believe, in 2019, and you have interviews with him spliced throughout the entire movie. And he's well known for his laugh, right? He had that great laugh that people talked about in the film. What an incredible array of people that you had documenting this time, post-McCarthy era, and these 
phenomenal, some of the best writers ever in the business who simply couldn't get work. And then comes in George Leto. And as he said, famously said, I'm not afraid to represent anyone. But in your film, the way he spoke, he seemed like such a, a mild mannered man. What's well, my he, father, a mild? Yeah, I mean, he was, there were two sides to my father. I used to say that my father was equal parts teddy bear and equal parts monster. Right. You know, he could be a real tough guy. I mean, he grew up on the streets of South Philadelphia. He used to joke that he had to fight his way home through five neighborhoods and he was like five foot six and 165 pounds. Right. His brother was a championship, a Golden Glove champion boxer, and then later went on to become the president of a labor union. So, you know, they, they made them pretty tough in the Lido family. There were eight kids. Oh, yeah. And he was the seventh of eight, so he got picked on by all his brothers and sisters. Of course. And, and he was beloved by his sisters. I mean, I was very close to particularly two of his sisters, Rose and Virginia. And they adored him. But at the same time, you know, they were hard on him. My father, who didn't, you know, didn't take guff from anyone, my little tiny five foot two Aunt Rose, and I'm five foot two as well. You know, when the two of us would say, hey, enough, he'd stop. But no, oh, wow. one, else, no one else. Because my father was, he was gregarious. He lived big. He was a small man, but he lived big. He had a great zest for life. He had a great laugh. He loved Italian food. He loved traveling to Italy. He loved travel in general. Everything he did, he did with an enormous amount of passion. And that included loving his daughters. And even my mom, who they didn't stay together, but he was an incredible ex-husband, in my opinion, because he took care of my mother even after he died. Yeah, and your mom's name... Do. Your mom's name is Jackie, right? And she spoke beautifully about him throughout your film. Um, you're, you're right about that. I mean, you were a family. And tell me about growing up. You uh, were born, right, in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, and lived on the famous Benedict Canyon, right? I'd I love did. to know about some of the people that were in and out of your house, because basically you were Hollywood elite, right? Talk to me about that. Sure. Well, uh, my father um, had a standing party about once a month on a Saturday for a number of years when I was little. I don't oh, yeah. remember the very early days, obviously, but my mother tells me that they would put me in the, at a bassinet and put right. me on the center piece of the dining room table. And the people would just pass me around. And so I would be sitting on famous Waldo Salt's lap, who wrote Midnight Cowboy, who they now have a screenwriting award at, at Sundance for. Marty Scorsese used to come to the house because he idolized Abraham Polanski, who made his favorite movie, The Force of Evil. Steven Spielberg oh. used to come to the house. Then the musicians that used to show up, Frankie Valli, Frankie Avalon, the famous Pino Donaggio, who wrote that song, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, that Dusty Springfield covered in English, but in Italian was, you know, an anthem. Um, you just never knew who was going to pop by. Jimmy Darren, you know, the famous 50s singer and actor. Wow. <laughs> I mean, these were friends. These were right, I was going to say, yeah, these were your friends. This was what you knew, you know, the same way that a lot of us who grew up and had the block party and the electrician next door came over. These were the people that you knew, right? Right. So at, at five or six years old, you know, they found, they realized I could sing. And so my dad started teaching me funny jazz songs. And we would, you know, somebody would sit at the piano, my father, my mother, and they'd play. And I would sing, like, I sold my heart to the junk man, which is hilarious when you're five years old, right? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That <laughs> and, is great. Yeah. So, and, and it was just a really fun night. because You just never knew who was going to sit at the piano. And the piano was always a centerpiece in my family. Everybody loved musicians. My father never fell away from his love of music. And he continued to work on the songs that he wrote when he was in his 20s, well through his years. And I put some of them in the documentary as well, because his life wouldn't be complete without showing how much he loved music and how much it was a part of his life and mine, too. I play the piano, as you can see. You know, I, I sing. I was a trained singer. I, I trained for Broadway. What I originally wanted to do was sing and dance on Broadway. But when I uh, optioned my first script and I made a boatload of money, I said, hell, I hate auditioning. I think I'd rather do this. <laughs> what was that script? What was, was that called, script? Tell us. Any four women could rob the Bank of Italy. I still own it. It reverted back to me. 
And it's about four women who dressed up like men and robbed the Italian mail train that brings the money to all the post offices because there's a loophole in the Italian law. Now, I would never test this in reality, but it's great for a story that says if you steal from the government and you return the money before they catch you, they can't prosecute you. There you I go. thought it was a great idea for a story. It's based on a book. And the problem I had getting it made 25 years ago when I wrote it was everyone told me it was too smart and nobody was going to make a movie about four women being smarter than men. Well, maybe today people would be interested. So maybe I was just ahead of my time. But it is quite funny. Wow. It's a wonderful romp in Italy. So we take sort of we take a few pot shots at, at the uh, Italian bureaucracy and, at, you know, at life in general at how how difficult sometimes it is to be a woman in, in oh, a world absolutely. where, yeah, in a world where, you know, we are still in many countries not equal. So um, my father, however, used to tell me that I could do anything I wanted to do. I could be anything I wanted to be. And he never stood in my way. If I wanted to pitch baseball, he taught me how to pitch overhand. And for a while, I pitched on a little league team overhand with the boys. Um, and I really, I was really grateful to have a man who did not see convention as a constriction. He just saw it as something that you decide if you want to be part of it or not. And when you saw, when you saw Dad um, interacting with the people that he represented. Um, how did that rub off on you now that you look back on it? I'm amazed at how much he loved and adored and respected his clients yeah. <clears throat> because today agents are like clearing houses. They take a phone mm -hmm. call and they make a deal and that's it. And maybe some of them are friends with their clients. They're very big clients, but my father loved his clients no matter what level they were at. And he lent them money when they were short of money I and mean, nobody does that anymore. And he, I remember when he was representing Bob Altman, he told me stories about, you know, they were so broke and he owed them so much money that sometimes he'd just bring over groceries so as not to embarrass his wife, you know? Oh, wow. He'd just drop off groceries. They didn't do well, stuff like that anymore, you know? They just don't. Well, that was a common theme throughout the documentary, um, that your dad was very generous your dad was very caring. And if he believed in someone, he didn't really care what anyone else had to say about them. He would make sure that they were represented and that they got uh, a fair shake, right? Sure. I mean, he got Robert Altman the job of directing MASH after 17 directors turned the script down because they didn't know what to do with it. And nobody wanted to work with Bob Altman. Bob Altman was a pariah at the time because he had pissed off Kraft Theater, which was like Hallmark Hall of Fame at the time. By saying right. in the press that Kraft was more bland, Kraft theater was as bland as its cheese. And he got fired for obvious reasons. And he was considered kind of Peck's bad boy. And my father had this short film that he had financed for Bob to make called Pot au Feu, which is about what the world would be like if pot were legal from the eyes of people in the 60s when, right, right. you know, you, you could go to jail for 20 years. And it's a very funny little short film. And that film got passed around Hollywood. I mean, it became sort of like a little cult classic among the Hollywood executives. Nobody wanted to give the film back. And that is the movie that got Bob Altman the job at Fox to direct MASH. Can you imagine? Wow. That's incredible. When did uh, the blacklisting finally end? Did it just sort of peter out? Like, what happened? Because it was serious stuff where people couldn't, uh, get work, feed their families, and how many writers were affected at the time? Oh, God, there were uh, more than the Hollywood 10 and the Unfriendly 19. There were probably, between writers, directors, and actors, you know, there were thousands of people, actually, that had been blacklisted. Yeah. But yeah. as amongst the uh, Hollywood community, it's hard to, for me to know the exact numbers, but I, I, would, I would venture a guess it's in the hundreds. That said, yeah. my father, by systematic breaking down the wall, starting with Midnight Cowboy and Waldo Salt, and then Michael Wilson and Planet of the Apes and Ring Arner Jr. and MASH, it became so popular to be a blacklisted writer as my father's client at a certain point that his clients that weren't blacklisted were now pretending <laughs> they were blacklisted. So they used to say that George Leto represented 17 of the Hollywood 10. So that's pretty funny. 
that's actually really something. And it says a lot about your dad, right? The power that he had, that George Leto walks in and recommends somebody. Um, you stop and listen and you want to be represented by him. Wow. So tell me, you in later years started working with your dad. Isn't that right? I did. I, I actually, not later years, I took my first job on a film at 15. I, I oh. decided that I wanted to learn. And I mm -hmm. wanted to um, buy a car at 16, and I didn't expect daddy to buy it for me, even though, you know, daddy could certainly afford it. Um, so I went to work on my first movie, and I worked as a wardrobe PA, because I figured the only thing I knew anything about was washing and ironing clothes, and that was pretty true. And right. I went on to then work on a second movie for him, and then I worked on JFK, and then I worked on some uh, stuff for Showtime, and... And I worked for other people, I worked for him, but somewhere in the 90s, in my 20s, my dad started raising a $100 million line of credit. And he called me up and said, Andrea, I need you. And I said, why? Mm. He said, because the investors are French and you speak French and I need your help. I need you to help me bridge the gap. So here I was working wow. with the head of Chase Bank, John Miller, the infamous John Miller, who lent $2 billion to DreamWorks to start DreamWorks as the, right. as the head of Chase Entertainment, right? right. And, the, and the two biggest insurance companies in the world, AIG and AXA, which is a French company. And I was sitting there right at the table with everybody else. And I learned all about raising money for films, how film financing worked, how distribution worked, how insurance companies work and how they amortize their profits and their losses. I got an incredible education and I was in my early 20s. Yeah, there's the entrepreneur in Andrea, right? There it was, self-taught and brought on by dad, honestly. Um, well, that's incredible. So dad also, um, you know, worked again later years with Brian De Palma, one of my all time favorites. Talk to me about some of the, you know, those times, what that was like, uh, because he continued to, you know, then go on to produce films, right? George Leto Productions, right? Right. So um, Brian had done Sisters and right. uh, he, Ed Pressman and Brian had asked George to help uh, sell the movie um, to distribution. And after George had done such a good job selling sisters, Brian demanded practically, George, you have to be my agent. My dad said, I'm not wow. going to be an agent for more than a year. I'm going to close my doors and become a producer. And he said, I'd rather have you for one year than never. Wow. And so he represented Brian and they put together Brian's film Obsession, which my father produced and he financed using our house because of course he hadn't taken enough Oof. risk in his life. No, <laughs> he of course signed not. away our home. I was all of four years old. My mother was pregnant with my sister. And oh my <laughs> I know. And I, I laugh about this because it all worked out just fine. But um, he he financed Obsession and uh, Cliff Robertson, Jean Vier Bougeau, the actors, and it introduced John Lithgow. That was his first job. Yeah, and I've, I've, go ahead. It was a huge success. There was a line around the block at the opening day at the Baronet Coronet, which is a famous one-run theater, you know, movie house in New York City. And my dad took a walk and decided to see, you know, how, how the line was going. It was around the block. It was an instant hit. And to this day, I still make money on Obsession because I, as the uh, head of my father's company, own the rights in the foreign Ooh. markets. So Sony, Columbia, formerly Columbia Pictures, distributes it in the United States, but I sell this film all over the world, thus the entrepreneur. So wow. I own several rights. I own an Altman movie. I have a Jonathan Kaplan movie called Over the Edge, which was the first rock score. Um, that was Kurt Cobain's favorite movie. I sell these films to big distribution companies around the world and I make the deals and I handle all the paperwork and I have to deal with the, uh, you know, VAT tax return and all the fun stuff that goes along with administrating these things. So when I went to make this documentary, I like to say that my father prepared me well because yeah. I learned all of this. I knew how to finance it. I know how to sell it to distribution when that day comes. I knew how to hire all the people. I, I had worked on movie sets for years, so I, I can do just about everything except run the camera because it's a very specialized thing. You know, I don't run the editing equipment in the editing room, but my editors can tell you that I know exactly what I want. Um, yeah. I'm a musician, so I sit very carefully with the composer and we, we come up with the score. Every single aspect of this documentary 
has my imprimatur on it and I wanted to yeah. make sure it accurately reflected my father and to some extent me. Yeah. Um, so you were never really afraid to do or take on anything. Obviously learned that from George Leto. What was it like when the FBI would come knocking at the door? Was that scary for you? I was a baby. I was a yeah. baby. So when it happened, my mom was terrified. <laughs> my mom was afraid to get dragged away. But my father was so fearless and also rational because yeah. he explained to them, you know, I don't care what they write. When I sell it, that's called capitalism. Mm. And you don't have a right to arrest me for being a capitalist. I love Nor that. Nor do you have a right he... to arrest me for being a communist either. But he was, he was smart. He turned it on its head. He said, what are you going to arrest me for? Making money? <laughs> they Then the door shut and they were looking at each other saying, you know, the guy's right. You know, right? I mean, what, what, what did they do? So eventually they just didn't come back and they left George alone, right? Yeah, I think they gave up when he finally said, you know what, guys, you got me. You're right. I'm not a capitalist. I'm a royalist. I want to be king, king of the Hollywood business. Now get out. <laughs> I love it. You know, and you he hear- having you, fun with them. Right. You hear enough of that and you grow up thinking, well, George wasn't, if dad wasn't scared of anything, I'm not going to be either. Wow. That's, that's right. What was dad's favorite film? He talked about that in your documentary. Body and Soul. Body Why? and Soul. What? Uh, written by Abram Polanski, who ended up becoming my godfather, which is an amusing story all in itself. Mm -hmm. And um, it was because it was a, it's a Faustian, it's a story about a Faustian bargain, about a boxer from, you know, Brooklyn, similar to South Philadelphia, who has to make a choice. He has to decide whether or not he wants to take a dive for the money, or he wants to stand up and fight to the end, because all the people in his neighborhood were counting on him. They would yeah. all lose their money. They had all been betting on him, and he was a hero to them. And could he, you know, could he, give up his integrity for the money, for the fame. And he decided that he couldn't. And then oh, he wow. had that famous line at the end, spoiler alert, where they said, you know, you can't do that. And he said, what are they going to do? Kill me? Everybody dies. Wow. And That's deep. Yeah, yeah. Well, my godfather, Abram Polanski, was a philosopher in addition to being a writer. He was also a trained lawyer. He went to NYU, went to law school. Really blacklisted. Man. Brilliant, brilliant man. Brilliant. And, of course, Russian Jewish and I'm Italian Catholic, right? So my parents lied to the priest and said he was Polish Catholic. <laughs> so that oh, he boy. Be my <laughs> Which, again, I, I love my dad for that because... It wasn't about the religion. For him, it was about, I want Andrea to have this wonderful man in her life. And I'm right. so grateful that he did that because he was, he and my father were two incredible influences on my life. They, they taught me both, taught me to be fearless, to think for myself, to be my own person, to never depend on anyone else, to always, you know, you figure out how you need to do it for yourself. Yes, sometimes mm. we all need help, but in the end of the day, you have to be your own best friend and stand up for yourself. And what were some of the, I'm sorry, what were some of the Italian traditions that you upheld in your home? Um, was it about the food? Was it about, what was oh, yeah. it? Well, Talk first of all, my that. dad used to say, never waste a good meal on bad food. So yeah, <laughs> that <laughs> he was he would actually be in a bad mood if he had a bad meal. It would just ruin his entire day. But we, we sat at the table as a family and we ate as a family. Um, my mom cooked very traditionally, mostly Southern Italian cuisine. My grandparents were great cooks as well. My father's family had a bakery and, and I worked in the bakery in South Philadelphia when I'd go visit. Um, and I learned how to oh, make wow. cakes and cookies and cannoli, all that fun stuff, decorate wedding cakes and things like that. So uh, food was a big part of our lives. And I, I cook today. I'm part of, you know, when I was a little girl, I, they would hand me a wooden spoon and a stool and have me stand at the stove and stir the sauce. Mm. It was part of our lives. And I'm so also very grateful because it made me uh, interested in cooking. And 
when I went to Italy in my 20s, I learned how to cook from a lot of different Italian mamas. I had them all teach me something. And to this day, I, I still think about all the things that I've learned and how cooking and food brings people together. And yeah. it's so much a part of being Italian. And I love that. Yeah, I will tell you, I was the youngest in my family. I was the youngest, practically, of many of the cousins. And by the time I came around to cook with my mom, it was like, go, go outside and play. I think because I made a mess, you know, no matter what it was. And I would watch, but I didn't cook a lot with my hands. I would just watch them. Go, go, leave. So I'm not the best cook. I'm not going to blame anyone, but I was just saying, I didn't do a lot of it as a kid. Um, I'll show up and eat everybody's food and I'm trying to do my best because I'm remembering the recipes, right? But that's very important as a kid to really get dirty and get in there and 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 make it happen because that's such a part of our culture to be a be a part of that, right? It is so important. And I I have pictures of me at three years old stirring a bowl of God knows what. I mean, I have no idea right. what I was stirring, but you know, I'm stirring something. And my mom remembers, I sort of remember that around 13 years old, my mom, I gave my mom a birthday party. I called up all her friends and invited everybody. I was producing at 13 years old, invited everybody. I had my dad take me to the grocery store and I bought all the food and I had a family friend help me cook everything and, you know, put it out as a buffet. And, and, you know, I was a typical Italian girl in, in that way. I was very conventional in my own way, but at the same time, I've always been a very independent trailblazing woman because I'm so much like my father. And, right. um, and I think you can have both. In fact, when I mentor young women, cause I have a few women that I, I, that are younger than me that I try to teach about the business and life. And I always tell them that there, you don't have to, you don't have to look tough. You don't have to give up your femininity if you don't want to, in order to be a strong, independent woman, I will wear pink to a meeting and, and I will run that meeting. I famously yeah. told, you know, heads of studios that I thought they were acting like five-year-olds five year old, and I didn't bat an eyelash, you know? Did they and come, he, wait, did they come back? Um, they, well, this one famously said to me, do you have any idea who you're speaking to? And I said, yes, somebody who's gonna be out of a job in six months. And he was out of a job in five. So I was pretty right. Oh. Wow. I love that George Lito's daughter. Look what you picked up from him. I love that. I, it's fair to mention, uh, my father moves mountains. There's a reason why you chose that for the title. And I'm not going to tell people here because I want them to see the film and find out for themselves. I love the reasoning behind that, but I'm not giving it away because people need to, you know, see it for themselves. It's not tell a me. metaphor. That's it. That's all I will say. Yeah, it's actually very brilliant. And the opening is so darling. I just loved it. I mean, I really, really did. In fact, I, I believe it's just shy of two hours. And I thought, oh, wow, what could she have to say about her dad? Honestly, you could have given me three hours and I would have kept watching and listening. It's that good. Um, and I really mean that. It's phenomenally well made. How did you get all the different people? You called them up and said, doing a film about dad, need to come interview you. You had a lot of people in that film, Andrea, a lot. Some of them I had to ask several times. I mean, it wasn't an, an immediate yes, because when I showed them the little sizzle reel of what I put together, just my dad and me, my my Aunt Rose, and um, it, was, it was just family that I had at first. Um, Glenn Frankel was the first person to say yes, and he was a, he's a journalist for the Washington Post. Yes. And he also yes. wrote two books on the blacklist, um, High Noon, about High Noon and Midnight Cowboy. And um, so he was my first yes, and he was a friend of a friend. So I, yeah. I, I got that, and I made a little sizzle reel. And a lot of people said, well, I'm not sure what you're doing. I mean, is this a personal love letter? Is this about right, blacklist? Right. And, and I said, listen, um, it's both. Yeah. Because I can't tell the story of my father without injecting how I feel about him and, and, and my emotional, you know, my emotional being into this movie. I'm not going to just tell a dry documentary. This is not going to be your average documentary. This is going to be a little different. And if you trust me, I'll, you know, I'll, I promise that you will not be disappointed as, to be part of it. So the first person after that, that I got was, um, I was able to get uh, John Patak, who is a legendary agent for CAA. Mm -hmm. And because of who he is, 
it really helped me get a lot of other people. And I, I give right. him so much credit for believing in me. He knew me for a number of years as you right. know, George's sidekick, um, <laughs> as he used to call me. And, and so I really appreciate that he, cause, but he didn't know me as a filmmaker. He, right. he was right. pleasantly surprised. And actually, the thing he loved most was that I had incorporated some animation into the documentary. And he thought that was very clever, the way very I had clever. used it. Very clever. And also, um, a lot of documentation from, you know, historical reels. It was very, very well done, you know, about what happened at the time to these people. Um, Ronald Reagan was present uh, in this film. There's really Orson yeah. Welles. I mean, this is really steeped in a lot of history. Yeah. Very, very well done. In fact, you've won many awards uh, already for this uh, film. Would you tell us about that? I have won 16 small and midnight, mid-sized festivals and 22 awards, including Best Feature, uh, Documentary, Best Director, Best Writer. I mean, I best animation even somebody gave us an animation award um I'm, I'm applying to the bigger festivals like tribeca and you know the academy qualifiers and i'm waiting to hear from them um both overseas you know sheffield is a major festival for documentaries right. as well like, right, i right. apply to them um tell you ride you know i i have a site called film freeway where i get to watch every week they there's like a new notification um, so I started with small and mid-sized festivals to build momentum because I don't have a PR agency. I funded this myself. I used my own personal money. I'm not wealthy, um, as well as my father did, you know, in, towards the end of his life, end of life care is expensive and things like that. And, you know, we, I didn't end up, you know, as, as wealthy as I was as a child, but it didn't bother me. I figured I'd put it together with spit and glue and make it happen. So I'm doing this myself and I have the support of, you know, John Patak, former big agent, Barbara Defina, who was Marty Scorsese's partner for a number of years, is my producing yeah. partner on another <clears throat> project. She's my big supporter. I, I mean, I have some big people in my corner, and those people don't necessarily ever bother to help you out if they don't think what you've done is worthwhile. I'm just yeah. waiting for <clears throat> Tribeca to pay attention. And also... You know, the Academy, one of the reasons I did this is because in the 2020 in memoriam, the Academy left my father out. Mm. And that really broke my heart because of what he had done to change the face of this business. I, I really thought of all the people that deserve to be on screen for the for 2020, that wasn't, you know, a big Hollywood name, that it wasn't a celebrity that people would know. Surely. They would have put him on there because so many of the Academy Awards that they gave away were to his blacklisted clients. Oh, wow. And or nominations as well. And I always felt, and I'm just going to say it right here, that the Academy ought to give my father a Hirschholz Award, which is the humanitarian. Award, because I can't think of anything more humanitarian than giving people their right to live, mm. their voice. Back. by risking his own career his own life his own financial situation to do that he risked everything to give them back their lives mm. and and he did it on a very personal level you know he didn't change a country in a certain way he changed this country absolutely but he he risked his own life his own career his own fortune because he wanted to do what he felt was right, which was to give these artists their right, their voice, their lives back, their livelihood back. Mm. And, and, in, and today, you know, the Academy is always talking about what it wants to do to be, you know, <clears throat> socially correct. I, I think that's a very good message for future filmmakers and agents and producers to give an award to somebody who stand, stood up for the people in this industry. Mm, beautifully said. Andre, I really appreciate you joining us on our podcast. Are there any anything else you'd like to add uh, for our audience to know? Um, how can they look at it? Um, anything else that you're working on in the future? Although I know this is your big project and you're looking to get it, you know, on the bigger stage. Uh, anything else you'd like to share? Uh, well, you know, write to the various film festivals and tell them that you want to see the film at the film festival. That's how you can see it. Literally. Yeah. Tell them that's what you want. Get on their social media pages. 
because they want to sell tickets. And mm -hmm. a film like mine that doesn't have a lot of big stars in and doesn't have a big company behind it, one of the things they're worried about is whether or not it's going to have an audience. Well, tell them it's going to have an audience. Stand up yeah. and tell them what you want. I'm working yeah, on other so socially conscious films and films that have a, a good impact in society because I'm my father's daughter. So I'm working with a, a group of financiers that I was approached. I was approached by them because of the documentary. I love it when money comes to me. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. And they are putting together a very sizable fund for me to produce films that have a message that you know, they don't hit you over the head with the message, much like my documentary, right. but they, they right. tell a story that that inspires you maybe to be a, a better human, a better person in, in various ways, or just think about things in a different way. Mm. And I think Very media well has said. the power to do that, you know? So, yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, for letting me watch this film. It's magnificent. Um, and I just thank know you. that it's going to have continued success. I really do, Andrea. It was so well documented. The people uh, spoke so highly of Dad. And I loved hearing from Dad and your Aunt Rose and your sister and Mom. I mean, it's just so well done. And, of course, with the historical uh, footage to document so much of what happened at that time, which was truly so unfair. Uh, to these people and your father made such a big and valid point and he was heard um, and the proof is in all the magnificent films that he is responsible for one of my favorites is Planet of the Apes I just love that film I could watch it today and the very very end you know the first one with Charlton Heston you know in the New York City subway just oh my gosh <laughs> to this day when I see that I'm like oh my gosh what an incredible scene. It was beautifully done. So um, he's responsible for so much. And now you are for telling us about his story and keeping that alive. So thank you, Andrea, for doing that. And thanks for joining us. And thank you so much. And I appreciate you having me on your show. Yeah, my father moves mountains. He literally did move a mountain. Let's get the film in uh, some other film festivals and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, by Andrea Lito. Well done. Uh, and you can watch our interview uh, with Andrea and all uh, Deborah Cobalt Live and Little Italy podcast platforms. Uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, on Instagram, and then on all audio platforms, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, any place you get your podcasts, just put in the name of ours and you'll find our interview with Andrea. So thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, look up Andrea, write to her. Um, and I look forward to having you join us next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.